you know, you told me as we talked on the pre-production meeting uh, that you want to talk about child likeness. And I knew I needed to hear that message because the Lord had woke me up that morning and said, um, you're very warlike, aren't you, Katie? And I was like, uh, yes, as a matter of fact, I am. I need more of that childlikeness. And I think that you're really seeking to be in that place with the Lord. Talk about that right now, would you? Yeah, I really need this in my heart. I have been going through some things personally in, in ministry where if I don't become like a child, then I will miss the essence of God's kingdom experienced in my life. And I want the fullness of my father to be experienced in my life. And I'm seeing as I study the scriptures, the fullness of my father experienced mm. is connected to whether or not I will be like a child. Mm. And, and somebody would say, well, what does it mean to be like a child? Well, Andrew Murray once wrote, the true beauty of childlikeness is the absence of self-consciousness. Mm. And, and I find that self-consciousness is the biggest block to God consciousness. Self-consciousness, it stops up our drinking of the river of God. We, we get so in our heads and turn everything to be about us, even we turn the Bible to be about us, but the Bible already has a hero and it's, and it's not us. <laughs> uh, but when I, when I look at uh, the disciples, I see something that's very common to man. In the 18th chapter of Matthew, it says the disciples came to Jesus and they said to him this question, who, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? They are thinking rank. They're thinking of themselves they're thinking where do i where do i fit in this whole thing and is he better than me am i better than him the whole focus of humanity is to compare ourselves with ourselves and this breeds discontentment this breeds sorrow this breeds so many problems inside of the heart of a man but jesus does something incredible when they expose this natural inclination towards greatness and rank and self-consciousness and self-resignation, self-exaltation. Jesus calls a child to himself, and he set the child before them. And he says, truly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become like children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself mm -hmm. as this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus performs a sharp course correction to their whole mentality. They're looking for thrones, and he's looking for children to gather on his knee. They're in two different worlds. Jesus is from above. They're from below. So their thinking is from the ground up. His is from heaven above. And God values children while they value rank or relevance or significance. Uh, we all know that children don't think like this. It's, it's not in their blood. And I think there's a couple of things that are very important to realize about children that helps us realize what God's looking for from us. And the first is that absence of self-consciousness. It's, it's, uh, it's a liberty from the weight of self and recognizes that all must be found in, in, in our Father. You know, oh gosh, when we were on the phone together, I actually wept when you said this part because, and, and I know so many of you are going to relate. Um, I feel tormented by self-awareness. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I need this. I want that. Oh, you know, I don't feel good today. Oh, you know, uh, I don't like the way I look in, in, in these clothes. Uh, I, I wish I wasn't getting old. Uh, I, wa I, I want this and that'll make my house look cooler and better and <laughs> I, it's like, oh, it's it's nonstop, Eric, that it's like self-awareness, self-desires, unholy passions. They are like a tormenting spirit. Um, I want to break free of self-awareness and only be Christ aware, Christ conscious. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us what are some of the things we can do to 
to break free of that torment, to get in that childlike state? What, what do you, what would you tell people? Well, as I read through the letters of Paul over and over again, I'm finding that there's all kinds of problems in these churches and they all have one root. And it's what you're talking about, which is the common human problem manifesting mm. itself in different ways, self-consciousness. Mm. And I find that Paul's remedy is always the same. It doesn't matter if you're in Galatians or if you're in Colossians or in Romans, he reminds them of the simple gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. He brings them back to simplicity. I mean, if you think about 2 Corinthians 11, Paul is talking to them and he says, I fear that as the serpent beguiled or tricked Eve, you would be led away from the simplicity and purity of Jesus. Wow. And so I find that a lot of times this self-consciousness is best combated by remembering our selfless Christ. Wow. If you think about Philippians, when he's talking to them about the two women that won't get along in the book of Philippians, at the, the last he talks about these two women, but in chapter two, he shows the solution. He says, have this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who didn't think it robbery to, 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 uh, to be equal with God. He literally empties himself and he puts on suffering. And I, I see all this and I, I, I say to myself, if I forget the gospel, then I slip into the problem of the churches. But if I can remember the gospel, I stay inside the universal solution. And so I would say very practically yep. to bring ourselves back to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yep. So look, guys, you know, you know, Eric and I talked about this um, on the pre-pro before the show, and you can do that so easily. When you are being tormented by me, me, I need, I want, I got to have, I'm angry, I'm bitter, I'm offended, I wish this person would do this, I wish my husband would, wouldn't do that. When you just only can think about what's going on inside of you and you can't break free to think outside to, to Christ who is actually inside of you, yes. then go back to the gospel, meaning just go to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. <laughs> Go read the stories about Jesus. When you're being tormented, open the scripture. Go read about what Jesus did as he was put through torment and torture mm. for you. Read the gospels. And I know an encounter will happen if yes. they do that. Right? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's promised. I mean, the scripture tells us in Galatians 3.13 that we receive the spirit by faith. And that faith in context is faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ. So when a man freshly puts his faith in Christ, he receives again the spirit. It's a constant receiving wow. of the spirit through the same way that you get it at the very, get him at the very beginning by faith. In Galatians, he says, how, when God works miracles among you, how does he work miracles? Is it not by faith? And then he says, how'd you receive the spirit? Was it not by faith? Wow. It's the reception of the spirit through the gospel. The gospel is an endless well. I once told a guy, we in the West, we look at the gospel as the runway that the airplane takes off from. Mm. But that's not what the gospel is. The gospel is the engine that keeps the plane in the air. <laughs> wow. it's, it, it's, the, it's the essence. Yeah. But we, we get very complex quickly because we're thinkers and we're very logical and we've been around this Christian thing in America and in the West for so long that we want to move on to something more, something better, something more deep. But all that's needed is inside of the gospel, healing, miracles, salvation, angelic activity, signs, wonders. It's all inside of the gospel itself. And if we mm -hmm. separate these things from or make them auxiliary to the gospel, then we end up getting into a unbalanced situation and we wonder why we know a lot about a subject, but we have no freedom in our lives. It's, it's the gospel and God has made it so simple. Uh, I, I once uh, read from Samuel Smiles over a hundred years ago. He said, Christ is like the sun. When you turn towards him, he casts behind you the oh. shadow of your doubts, fears, and burdens. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And that's the essence of what the gospel does. You turn your eyes to Jesus by remembering his face, which is the gospel of the glories of Christ, the excellencies of his person. When you turn your attention there, the, sh- the light shines on your face and casts behind you all those things Whoa. that were causing such a problem. My God. Do you hear that, guys? It's so much simpler than we think. You know, uh, I was telling Eric when we were on, um, and I love how you said, Eric, you said the potency of the gospel. Because yeah. it is potent. <laughs> it Amen. Is. It is potent um, that, you know, I'll even just like put a, I go to one of the old school movies uh, that's on YouTube. It's free. It's called the gospel of Luke rare HD version. And they went and they shot this movie back in the sixties at like 460 some odd locations in Israel. And Alexander Scorby, who does the new, the, the original King James voiceover for the Bible he is so oily and powerful. He does like the narration. And I, I had an encounter just watching that because it's the gospel, right? I mean, Eric, it's like they came to that one scene where Zacharias is fighting through a crowd. He's trying to see Jesus. He's super short. He's trying to climb up rock walls and people are pulling him down. He finally gets up a wall and into a tree and he's up there and here comes Jesus with his disciples through the crowd and Zacharias has got the front row seat because he fought for it, right? He fought for getting up to see him. And then Jesus looks at him and goes, um, Zacharias, come down or Zacchaeus, come down. Uh, uh, I want to dine at your house today. And he says, my house. And when he said that, I burst into tears. I had an encounter with the Lord because the Lord was telling me, You've been fighting to get in my presence. You've been climbing every tree, trying to see me, trying to encounter me. You're short in stature, but not when you're around me because I see you. I see you fighting and I want to come to your house and eat with you. And I bawled my eyes out. So you're right. Just going back to the Gospels, we will mm-hmm. encounter who the Gospels are talking about who yes. they were written for, the Christ. Yes. It's beautiful. I uh, had a very similar situation happen to me, but it was from a child's song. Uh, I was struggling in my heart, and I felt like I needed to see Jesus fresh. I said, Lord, I need to see you again. I got to see you again, Jesus. And I felt like I was in a crowd, and I felt like there was people around me in my life, in my mind. And I felt like there was things surrounding me that were bigger than me and I couldn't see through them and I was cluttered. And I felt like the Lord, when I said to the Lord, I need to see you again, but I feel cluttered. I heard the Lord say to me, Zacchaeus was a wee little man. A wee little man was he. He climbed up a sycamore tree in Jesus he did see. The old child nursery rhyme. And I, I remembered that Jesus became a curse for us. The scripture says, cursed is he who dies on a Mm. tree. (laughs) And it it hit me like a ton of bricks that if I will just go to the gospel, the gospel tree, I will be able to see him. And that will not only cause me to see him, but I will from there sup with him and enter into communion with him. And this is how he will dwell in my home and eat with me is is if I climb the the gospel tree when I cannot see. (laughs) Wow. I love that so much. You know, um, you said to me that Jesus beckons the children, just like Jesus <laughs> said to Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus, I want to dine at your house. And he was like the person everybody hated because he was like the tax collector, you know, and then he ended up giving back all the money four times what I have taken. I give back, you know what I mean? Because he encountered Jesus, right? But here's Jesus talking to a guy that everybody hates and goes and eats at his house. But you said, that's what Jesus does to children. He tells them, come, you know, come and sit on my knee. And then if we respond to that, then we get to spend that innocent childlike time with the Lord. Talk about that. Yeah, that's important. I feel in my life, and it may be important to others as well, because we're all in a common human situation. But if I grow up in certain parts of my heart, and what I mean by that is become independent, because children are 
dependent? Who, who's the most cared for in the home? Is it not the most dependent? And so it is in our lives. God can only take the cares of those who give him their cares. Uh, he was it say, cast your cares upon the Lord because he will do the caring for you. He cares for us. And so whatever I don't relinquish to him, he can't be for me. And it's that holding on to things that is independence. I can do this. I got this. I can figure this out. It's that holding on to these things. That's a grown up mentality. When the child easily relinquishes it to the father and the father then can touch and bless the child. Jesus called for the children and he touched them and blessed them. I wonder how many of our heads Jesus passes over because we're too old. You know, we've, we've, we've grown up too much and, but he touches and he blesses those that are childlike, the children, the kingdom of heaven, he says, belongs to such as these. He's not saying the children are one type or kind in the kingdom. He's saying, this is the only kind. Uh, it's mm. a kingdom of children, children who are dependent upon their father. They've lost or they they have the absence of self-consciousness and they trust in him to care for them in these various areas. It's interesting too to note that when Jesus performed the glorious multiplication of food, mm. the food was surrendered to him by the hands of a child. This boy has these, uh, these you know, fish and loaves in it. In, uh, maybe, just maybe, there isn't a multiplication of things in our lives because we're too grown up to surrender the little that we do have to Him. Mm. Uh, maybe what God is waiting for is for us to become childlike enough to say, I don't have much, but you're my, you're my Father, and I trust you. And from there, God can grab a hold of such faith, such mm. trust, and cause a miracle to, to take place. I, I feel like it's significant. John loves this phrase. When you see first, second, third John, my little children, he even connects little children, abide. He says, my little children, abide. Mm -hmm. And you see abiding even has to do with a childlike trust. It's, it's, it's a independence that moves away from trust. I remember Hudson Taylor once wrote, is there not a more sure evidence of Adam's fall than distrust in God. And I feel like that's the essence of growing up. We grow mm. out of absolute trust in God for everything, and we begin to become independent. Did you guys hear that? Um, look, again, we need to go to Jesus for him, yeah, not for what he can do. He, you know, he's not a vending machine, but it's hard <laughs> To do that when you're in pain, when you're in pain physically, when you're in pain in your heart, when your children are out on the street and you're afraid for them, it's hard to just say, well, I'm just going to come to you, Lord, and not worry and, and bring my prayer requests or anything else to you. I'm not going to, you know, bring my list of needs. I'm just going to come to you. It's hard to do that, right, Eric, at that moment, you know, just to say, I'm just going to come to you, Jesus, even though, I mean, it was hard for Mary. She, her brother just died, but yet she managed to just throw herself at the feet of Jesus yeah. without really, you know, uh, anything else but, uh, you know, going to him and adoring him yeah. and needing him, being dependent yeah. on him. But when we do that, when we fight through that resistance, we're going to have that miracle, like the child bringing the, the, the loaves to Jesus. A miracle did happen, like, yes. like it happened for, you know, Mary. Uh, her brother was resurrected. How do we break through that moment to get into that childlike place when we're desperate and we're in pain and we're and we're in agony and depression and we're overwhelmed? How do we break through? Do, do we fight through to the gospel? What is it? Sure. I, I really feel like one of the biggest problems in that state of being, which I've been in in different ways, and many of us have been in that state in various ways, um, the difficult part is we still want to hold on to the thing or we want to push or press. I think the best way to do it is to say things like or as bankrupt as, Lord, I 
need you to help me believe you for this. And if mm-hmm. I'm honest, I don't believe you. Oh, wow. So I need your help. Oh, Lord, oh. help my unbelief. I think if we're willing to be that kind of vulnerable, then the mask comes off and we actually begin to pray. Jesus, when he taught prayer, he says the first thing, when he's teaching us to pray, he says, do not be like the hypocrites. The word hypocrite means interpreter from beneath because the actors would wear a mask and perform their role from underneath a mask. Yeah. And so when Jesus says, when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, he says, masks off. You, you, you have got to be vulnerable and open hearted with me. So I think sometimes we want to front like we believe something when we really don't and we need the Mm. spirit's help to quicken the scriptures and make them alive to us we need the gift of faith that comes from the spirit and i think it begins when we realize we don't have it the more bankrupt we can we can find ourselves the more dependent we can be the more real our prayer is the more bankrupt in, in poverty the more poverty we can find in our hearts the more the kingdom is realized because blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And that's that childlikeness, that poverty, unless my father does it, it will not be done. And I think it's time that the church can be honest and vulnerable with the Lord enough to say things actually like this, even more than miracles. Lord, I, I need you to help me love you. Mm. I, I need your help loving you. Wow. And when we become that honest, that's when the, the mask is off and the spirit, he loves this kind of truth and he can come in. And it's that kind of bankruptcy that puts him right where he is and gives him the access he desires, which is all access. Oh, wow. Okay. This is really amazing. 